Again, welcome. My name is Dr. Alexandra Kopelovich with Physiogram eLearning. This is our fourth webinar, I believe. Today, um, we are switching gears a little bit. We're going to the shoulder girdle. So we'll be talking about the sternoclavicular and acromioclavicular joints. Um, I would like to thank everyone who's coming back from the previous meetings and welcome everybody who's new. Just a little bit about myself. I am a doctor of physical therapy. I am an orthopedic specialist, a manual therapy practitioner. I am finishing up my fellowship with North American Institute of Manual Physical Therapy this summer. Um, and I'm working on my DSC Doctor of Science with Andrews University currently. Um, I am also an adjunct professor teaching biomechanics and kinesiology. Um, so this is obviously a topic very close to home, um, joint mechanics, that's all I do. So <laughs> let's get into it. So I really hope you enjoyed today's presentation. Alrighty, so our objectives for today is to, of course, we're gonna be talking about sternoclavicular and acromioclavicular joints. So we will identify these joints. We will identify the degrees of freedom available at both of these joints. We'll take a look at the osteo and arthrokinematics. So um, just a quick review, osteokinematics, everything that has to do with the bone moving itself. And arthrokinematics is of course with the prefix, prefix arthro, anything that has to do with the joint motion specifically. So osteokinematics is the gross bone movement. Arthrokinematics is the small roll, glide and spin of the joint itself. And um, of course, as was the previous um, our um, presentations, um, we have to be able to apply today's information to your clinical practice. And that's the most important thing, uh, the most important goal of my presentation. So being able to take it and apply it to your clinical scenario to um, any patient that presents to you with shoulder pain. So uh, we're going to get started with a little pop quiz. So we're going to start a poll. So you can read the question from the screen. And I'm just going to pull it away. So that's my first poll. So um, and of course, no pressure. So don't worry about it. <laughs> None of the scouts, no grades here. Um, what joint or joints connects the upper extremity to the axial skeleton? Is it the sternoclavicular, acromioclavicular? costomanubrial? Is it sternoclavicular and acromioclavicular? Is it acromioclavicular and costomanubrial? Or is it all three of the above? So I'm going to launch this poll and I'm going to give you 30 seconds to answer and just go ahead and I'm going to show you the results. And I just wanna make sure that all of you are muted. So just keep yourself on mute. And one more thing, just keep all the questions up until the end and I will gladly answer all of them at the end of the presentation. So this way we don't really get interrupted throughout this. I'll give you another 10 seconds to go. So what joint or joints connects the upper extremity to the axial skeleton? Is it one, two, three, four, five, or six? <laughs> All righty, and I'm gonna end the poll. Let's take a look at the results. Okay, so here are the results in my main screen and 33%, um, so the majority got the answer correct. It's the sternoclavicular joint. So it's luckily it's one of the joints we're gonna be discussing today. Um, some other people think it's all three, no. Um, so let's take a look at the image and you'll get, um, you'll get the idea of it right away. So let me close this. So here's the sternoclavicular joint. So as I mentioned, um, sternoclavicular joint um, starts with the sternal end of the clavicle. So this is the long clavicle right here. And this is the sternal end of the clavicle. And it connects to the clavicular facet on the manubrium. So manubrium, that's a video your axial skeleton, right? That's your spine and your sternum. So this is the connection of the entire shoulder girdle to the axial skeleton. There is no connection through the scapular thoracic joint because scapular thoracic joint is really um, not a true joint. It's just um, it's held together by muscles, not um, 
uh, by synovial joint um, or a capsule. So um, yes, so sternoclavicular joint serves as the only attachment of the shoulder complex and upper extremity to the axial skeleton. It's right here. So let's take a look at some details. So sternoclavicular joint is classified as a saddle joint. So what is a saddle joint? It's probably going to be a review for all of you. Um, and you can see the definition of it right here. Beautiful picture um, by the illustrator here. So saddle joint is a joint in which each joint surface um, is convex in one plane and concave in the other plane, meaning that clavicle will be convex in one plane and concave in the other direction. And same thing with the manubrium. It's going to be concave in one plane and reciprocally convex in a different direction. So this is the definition of a settle joint. So sometimes um, in certain texts, you will see that a sternoclavicular joint is classified as a plain synovial joint, just because that saddle definition is not really there. So for example, I have my model here, and this is the sternal end of the clavicle. And if you look here, it looks pretty flat. It doesn't really have that beautiful, as here we have the illustration of the convexity and concavity. Here, it looks pretty plain. So yes, patient mechanics will vary and you have to compare both sides sides, uh, right side to the left side of the clavicle if patient does have an issue with that. But typically, these are the uh, mechanics that we will examine. So the degrees of freedom here, we have three possible degrees of freedom. We have um, three osteokinematic movements allowed with the three degrees of freedom. So like I said, osteokinematic movements are the gross uh, bone movements that we can see. So osteokinematically, I'm going to show you on myself with my right clavicle here. Um, we have elevation, that's the movement. Um, we have depression, that's another movement. We have protraction when the clavicle comes forward this way. And we have retraction when the clavicle comes back. And lastly, we have rotation or spinning movement of the clavicle. We have an anterior spin and we have a posterior spin of the clavicle. Give me just one second. I am going to... Um, Okay, um, sorry about that. Okay, so um, joint architecture. It's very important to talk about joint architecture in this joint, um, about the convexity and concavity. This way you're gonna be able to know what the arthrokinematics are at the joint and some things that you're gonna be able to palpate with your patients as they go through differential shoulder girdle movements. Um, so, so let's take a look at this. I think, once again, I think it's a beautiful image. So it's important to know that clavicle, and you, you can just remember one of them. You don't have to remember both. If you're gonna remember the clavicle, you're gonna know that the manubrium is completely opposite of that. So the architecture of this joint is completely opposite. So take a look here, going from bottom to top, so inferior to superior. The clavicle here is convex. So you can see how it's shaped as a um, opposite C, right? It's shaped this way. And then going from um, outside to the inside, so anterior to posterior, we have this concavity, right? So inferior to superior, clavicle is convex. And anterior to posterior, there is a little bit of a divot here. It's concave. So this will di dictate, once again, the arthrokinematics allowed at the joint. And if you look at the manubrium, it's completely opposite. So you can remember also the manubrial um, architecture as well. Just for myself, it's always easier just to think of clavicle, because typically when we think about upper extremity movement, we think about open kinematic chain, and that's when the clavicle is actually moving on top of the manubrium, not the manubrium. But of course, there are cases when um, biomechanically they need to identify the manubrial movement on top of the clavicle. But um, so manubrium from anterior to posterior direction is convex, right? You can see the convexity. And from inferior to superior direction, it's concave. So it's reciprocally opposite to the clavicle, and that's where the joint is actually congruent to one another.
So let's take a look before we go into orthokinematics at sternoclavicular joint components. We have three main components that we will examine. It's the disc, synovial capsule, and the three major ligaments that connect the joint. Um, if you actually palpate uh, your clavicular joint, right, you find the sternal end of the clavicle and you palpate the manubrium, the first thing you're going to notice is that the top portion of the clavicle does not articulate with the manubrium, right? So you can see that there is this gap in between the manubrium, this is where the manubrium ends on top, and the clavicle sits a little bit higher. So there's obviously a role for that. So the role is the attachment of the primary sternoclavicular ligaments, sternoclavicular disc, and of course the interclavicular ligaments. That's why the clavicle sits just a little bit higher to allow space for those structures, for the supporting structures of the joint. Sternoclavicular joint is surrounded by a fairly strong fibrous capsule, but it does depend on the stability of the ligaments, and we will examine the ligaments in just one second. Um, let's talk about the disc first. Once again, the disc, um, just as the ligaments, everything adds to the stability of the sternoclavicular joint, and that's why very rarely we see subluxations or dislocations of this joint in the first place. So the disc is a fibrocartilage. Um, disc or meniscus, you can refer to it in any way you would like. Um, and what it does, it increases the congruence of the joint. Um, it transects the sternoclavicular space diagonally, and you can see the disc right here. And it divides it into the manubrial cavity and the clavicular cavity right here. So it depends on the source you will read. Um, and once again, manual therapy articles that you will read, um, you will identify different things. So some say that um, arthrokinematics depend solely on the architecture of the clavicular surface and on the manubrial surface. Some other literature will say that, you know what, there is a disc in between. What the disc will do, it will also create a different shape and structure to the bone. So the disc can create the convexity or create concavity in the opposite direction. So um, it's not the main point of today's conversation, but I will just tell you that um, some, some literature pieces, they say that in elevation and depression, the clavicle just moves on top of the disc. But for protraction and retraction, clavicle will move on the disc and then it will pull the disc together and they will move together on top of the manubrium. And once again, some sources say that arthrokinematics will be slightly changed. Typically, sources agree on elevation and depression. The arthrokinematics with or without the disc will remain the same, but for protraction, retraction, it's still a gray area in terms of research. So let's do another poll and I'll launch it right now. So identify a ligament that is not part of the sternoclavicular joint complex. So I'm gonna start the next poll and start. So is it the interclavicular ligament? Is it the costoclavicular ligament, sternoclavicular ligament, or the trapezoid ligament? Let's see. What do you guys know? I'm going to give you 30 seconds for this one. And another five seconds to go. So identify a ligament that is not part of the sternoclavicular joint complex. Interclavicular, costoclavicular, sternoclavicular or the trapezoid ligament. And I'm gonna end the poll. And most of the people seem to be on the same page. That's great to know. And um, it's the trapezoid ligament. And I think even if you don't know ligaments and if you're a student, just an advice, just read ligaments are the simplest thing to identify, right? All of them have the clavicle component in it. Um, so, and the trapezoid doesn't. Also, the trapezoid also starts from the clavicle, but it's probably the easiest to, to know that it starts from the clavicle, sternum to the clavicle, costal rib to the clavicle, and interclavicular in between the clavicles. So ligaments are pretty straightforward to identify. Good job, everyone.
Alrighty, so let's take a look at the ligaments and the significance why I'm bringing that up in the first place. So here we have the three ligaments sitting on top. So on the very top, we have the interclavicular ligament. So let's talk about this one right here. So interclavicular ligament starts from the uh, top of one clavicle, spans onto the manubrium, and goes to the superior surface of the second clavicle. So what it does, it actually limits excessive depression of the lateral clavicle. So imagine there is a ligament here marked with my finger, and this is the proximal end of the clavicle. So it's going to limit excessive depression of the lateral clavicle. clavicle. It's not going to allow the clavicle to go down this way. Okay, and why is that important? With excessive depression of the lateral clavicle, we have some structure sitting here that might be compromised. So of course, you know what's what's there. It's the brachial plexus, it's the subclavian artery, the vein, everything that's uh, that can give you neurological or vascular symptoms, everything is right here. So this ligament is very important for preventing this movement. That is the osteokinematic movement. Um, arthrokinematically, it limits the superior glide of the medial clavicle, so this portion of the clavicle. So whenever we go into depression, this is the osteokinematic movement, we have an accompanying superior glide of the proximal clavicle. So this ligament, once again, limits depression of the lateral clavicle and superior glide of the medial clavicle. Well, we'll take a look at osteokinematics, but just know the ligaments for now. Now let's move on to the sternoclavicular ligament. And there are actually two portions to the sternoclavicular ligament. We have the anterior and the posterior, not showing in this image. So you can see how sternoclavicular ligament actually sits in the front. So you can already start reasoning and thinking, okay, what movements um, is it important for this ligament to check? So actually sternoclavicular ligament checks a protraction and it checks retraction. So uh, protraction is being checked by the anterior band and retraction is being checked by the posterior band. Okay, so these are our sternoclavicular ligaments. And finally, we have the costoclavicular ligament. It starts right here from the cartilage and a little bit of the bony attachment of the um, first rib. And it spans onto the undersurface of the clavicle. So once again, you can see where it attaches and you can see what its action is going to be. So it's going to limit excessive elevation of the lateral end of the clavicle, right? So if it sits right here on the undersurface, it's gonna prevent excessive elevation of the lateral portion of the clavicle. Now, of course, that's the osteokinematic movement. And arthrokinematically, it will limit all the superior directed forces of the medial clavicle. So anything that's gonna pull medial clavicle superior, it's gonna resist that movement. So there are a few muscles that you can think about that actually produce that pull. So it's very important to have an intact costoclavicular ligament, such as um, sternocleidomastoid or sternohyoid mus muscles. They all provide that superior force to the clavicle. So once again, that's the importance of the costoclavicular ligament here. So finally, let's get into the sternoclavicular joint arthrokinematics. Before we do, we need to review the concave and convex principle. And I'm sure all of you are familiar with that. So just gonna be a quick review. So we have a difference when a concave object moves on top of convex versus a convex object moving on top of a concave. So when a concave shaped joint surface moves on a convex shaped joint surface, the concave bone typically rolls and glides in the same anatomical direction. Opposite will be for the convex object moving on the concave bone. When a convex shaped bone moves on a concave shaped bone, the convex bone typically rolls in one direction and glides in the opposite direction. So when it's a convex surface, the glide will occur in the opposite direction. When it's a concave surface, the glide will occur in the same direction. So let's take a look 
Now, it's going to be a little bit tricky for the sternoclavicular joints. And why? Because we remember that sternoclavicular joint is a saddle joint. And that is why I stressed it in the beginning. So from anterior to posterior direction, as we mentioned earlier, we have a concavity. If we have a concave clavicle moving on a convex manubrium, as demonstrated in this picture, right? So for anterior and posterior movements, like protraction and retraction, the roll and the glide will occur in the same direction. So let's take a look at this example. Here it's sternoclavicular joint protraction. We have a concave surface of the clavicle that will roll anterior with protraction and will also glide in the anterior direction because it's concave, okay? So this is protraction. So we have an anterior glide. So when you palpate your patient's movement with protraction, what you typically would expect is an anterior glide of the proximal clavicle. Like I said, the literature is a little bit um, iffy um, for protraction and retraction, but you will de definitely be able to palpate elevation and depression for the sternoclavicular joint. So let's take a look at retraction. For retraction, once again, we have the same joint surface because anterior to posterior, the clavicle is concave. And here we have a concave surface of the clavicle that will roll posterior and glide posterior as well. So as you can see here, this is a superior view. We have the clavicle moving into retraction, the distal part of the clavicle moving into retraction. The roll and the glide occur in the same direction here. And once again, you can see that the anterior sternoclavicular ligament will be tensed. Also the costoclavicular ligament is tense in this case. So you can reason these things out. Okay, so for protraction and retraction, the roll and the glide occur in the same direction. Anterior roll, anterior glide for protraction, posterior roll, posterior glide for retraction. Let's take a look. Um, please mute yourself. <laughs> Let's take a look at the sternoclavicular joint elevation. So for elevation and depression, we spoke about the joint surface, and we know that from inferior to superior direction, the clavicle is actually convex. With convex clavicle, we know that the roll and the glide will occur in the opposite directions. So here, for sternoclavicular joint elevation, right? So when I do a shoulder shrug, or when I go up, when I just uh, go into upper extremity elevation, we have a superior roll of the clavicle, and that is going to be accompanied by an inferior glide of the proximal clavicular surface. Let's take a look. And that's something you can palpate certainly on yourself. So if you put your hands on the manubrium and the other finger on the clavicle and perform upper extremity elevation, you will feel that the proximal clavicle actually goes into that inferior glide. And you can compare bilaterally, see if there is a difference right to left side. Let's take a look at depression. So depression, of course, we expect it to be the opposite. So once again, the surface is the same from superior to inferior, the clavicle is convex. The roll and the glide will occur in the opposite directions. So here we have a convex surface of the clavicle rolling inferior, right? For depression, we roll inferior and the accompanying glide is gonna be in the opposite direction. So the glide is going to be superior. So with depression, we have an inferior roll and a superior glide. And right here, you can see that the interclavicular ligament and um, portions of the sternoclavicular ligament will be tense as we spoke about it earlier. Alrighty. So once again, I refresh the protraction retraction for you. For elevation, we're expecting an inferior glide. And for depression, we're expecting a superior glide of the proximal clavicular surface. Let's do another poll. Let's see. Um, here we go. So your patient is, a, uh, is an Olympic weightlifter. She presents with sternoclavicular region pain in the following position. So this is the position that she presents. Um, she says it's painful in the, specifically in that position. After performing a selective tissue tension test, 
you determine that she sprained a ligament. Which ligament did she most likely sprain? And I'm gonna launch the poll. Okay, so this is, uh, you, you have to, once again, I just taught you this information, so it's a direct retention. It's okay if you, if everyone doesn't get it, but let's just think about this movement. Look at the image. First, identify the osteokinematic movement that she's in, and then think what ligament blocks that osteokinematic movement. Is it sternoclavicular, costoclavicular, interclavicular? or the trapezoid ligament. I'm gonna give you another 30 seconds to go because I think you really need to think about it. I'm gonna mute myself for a second. Alrighty, so I'm going to end the poll. Let's take a look at the results. Okay, so most of you answered sternoclavicular ligament. Okay, costoclavicular ligament. Second place was interclavicular ligament. So actually, the correct answer is the costoclavicular ligament. Why is that? So costoclavicular ligament limits shoulder girdle depression. So if you're looking at this, I'm just going to exit out. If you're looking at this movement, you know that the patient's going into depression. And what I told you is that the ligament on top, the inter oh, why did I say costoclavicular? The interclavicular ligament will actually check the inferior displacement of the lateral clavicle. So the correct answer is the interclavicular ligament in this case. Uh, portions of the sternoclavicular ligament will also check it. So partially that's also a correct answer. But if we're looking at the direct answers, it's the correct answer is the interclavicular ligament. Alrighty, let's take a look at the second one. Where is my pull? And I am going to launch this one. Okay, so same patient, same movement. So we know it's shoulder girdle depression. Um, and after performing the uh, selective tissue tension test, you determine that sternoclavicular joint is hypomobile. Which glide is most likely missing? Is it the inferior glide, the superior glide, the anterior glide, or the posterior glide? So we determined that the joint is hypomobile. You palpate it. And you know that the patient osteokinematically cannot get into depression of the clavicle. And now you're thinking, okay, the osteokinematic movement of depression is associated with what glide? I'm gonna give you another 10 seconds. Okay. Alrighty. So most people answered superior glide and that is the correct answer. Okay. Why is it superior glide? So we spoke about the clavicle being convex in the inferior to superior direction. So with depression of the lateral clavicle, uh, it will be accompanied by inferior roll and a superior glide. The roll and the glide will occur in the opposite direction. So this is a correct answer. Good job. Okay, let me bring this out. Alrighty, so let's get into acromioclavicular joint. So acromioclavicular joint, just like sternoclavicular joint, is a synovial joint. So we have, um, we have the capsule, we have synovial fluid, but in this case, it's a planar joint. The main purpose of acromioclavicular joint, and um, once again, let me just... So here is my right clavicle, and this is my right scapula. So the acromioclavicular joint is formed by the distal end of the clavicle and the acromion process of 
the scapula, as you can see in the image on the screen. So the primary function of this joint is to set the glenoid in a proper position. So whether it's to set the scapula on the rib cage or to set the scapula in a good positioning for the glenohumeral joint to function, everything it does is to fine tune the positioning for the scapula to accommodate glenohumeral joint and to accommodate the position on the rib cage. Um, the articular facet here, um, as opposed to the sternoclavicular joint where we learned it's a saddle joint, here it's a planar joint. It means that in a lot of people, these joints are actually very different. So sometimes in the cadaveric dissections, they find that it's a planar joint. So there is two flat surfaces moving against one another. Sometimes they find that it's reciprocally convex and concave on the acromial side or opposite, concave on the clavicular side and convex on the acromial side. So really the architecture varies widely between individuals. And in this joint, unfortunately, um, studies have not been able to define actual arthrokinematics. So we do not know the role and the glide for the acromioclavicular joint. But as a therapist, what will be useful to you is knowing osteokinematics at this joint. And I think that's where a lot of therapists get lost. And that's not something taught very often in physical therapy programs. So I think that's a, that's a good thing to review. Um, so osteokinematic movements allowed at this joint are upward rotation, downward rotation, internal, external rotation, and anterior posterior tilting are also referred to as tipping of the scapula. So we'll look at these motions in just two seconds. Let's take a look at the components of the acromioclavicular joint first. So once again, just like sternoclavicular joint, we have the disc, we have the capsule, and we have the supporting ligaments. All of these structures reinforce the stability of the AC joint, even though we know that AC joint is inherently unstable joint. Um, the disc, sometimes it exists in people, sometimes it doesn't. Um, before two years of age, the joint, the acromioclavicular joint, is actually a fibrocartilaginous union. So it's a fused joint. After two years old, when the babies start moving their upper extremities, the fibrocartilage starts breaking down and the remnants of it move into the joint um, cavity. And there, the remnants actually become the disc or the menis meniscoid. So it really varies from person to person. And once again, typically discs serve as a stability component and also prevent the wear and tear of the joint. So if you do have it, that's great. If you don't have it, well, that's AC joint for you. Um, capsule in the acromioclavicular joint. Here we have a weak capsule com as compared to the sternoclavicular joint. So we certainly need a lot of reinforcement from the ligaments for this joint. So let's take a look at the supporting ligaments of the acromioclavicular joint. And here I have, um, so the first one highlighted here is the acromioclavicular ligament. Right here, we have the superior portion of it, and we also have an inferior on the surface por portion of the acromioclavicular joint uh, ligament right here. So acromioclavicular ligaments are um, supporting the joint, once again, reinforcing the capsule, and they're also helped by the deltoid and trapezius muscles that actually attach in the area, as most of you know. Um, next, we have the coracoclavicular ligament. So they start from the coracoid process of the scapula and they move to the undersurface of the clavicle. So here, the first ligament highlighted in green, the horizontal fibers actually of the trapezoid ligament. So it's shaped as a inverted um, trapezoid. So this ligament, because it's in that horizontal posi position, right? And you can see it here. It really prevents a posterior displacement posteriorly um, from anterior directed forces on the clavicle. So it doesn't allow the clavicle to go backwards posterior on top of the acromion. 
And secondarily, we have a second coracoclavicular ligament and it's highlighted here. So it's uh, obliquely oriented. And once again, it moves to the undersurface of the clavicle and that's a conoid ligament. This ligament restrains superiorly directed forces. So you can see how it starts from inferior and it moves into that vertical superior direction. So of course, it's gonna prevent any superior um, translation of the clavicle or subluxation. Um, so these two ligaments, um, even though they're not directly part of the chromioclavicular joint, they do stabilize it indirectly. So let's take a look at um, a chromioclavicular joint osteokinematic. So these are the things that you will be looking for in your patients. So the first osteokinematic movement we have here is upward and downward rotation. So upward rotation is the outward pivot. So once again, this is my right clavicle, right scapula. Your view is anterior to posterior. So this is my right shoulder moving this way. So we have upward rotation and that's upward and outward pivot of the scapula. And we have downward rotation of the acromioclavicular joint, downward and inward pivot of the scapula. So one thing to note here, and you can see the coracochromial ligaments um, were torn from my model because I wanted my clavicle to move a little bit more, but this is the coracoclavicular ligament, one of them. So basically what happens when you go into upward rotation, which is one of the components of the upper extremity elevation. So that's something you have to know. So when you go into upward rotation, this ligament right here, the costoclavicular ligaments, they actually get taut and they prevent that upward rotation of the scapula. But because they attach to the undersurface of the clavicle, what's going to happen is that to allow more movement, to allow more upward rotation of the scapula to occur at the acromioclavicular joint, these ligaments will pull on the clavicle and create a posterior spin because it attaches once again to the undersurface to allow, to take up more slack from that ligament. The clavicle will spin posterior with upper extremity with acromioclavicular joint upward rotation. So with upward rotation, what we're gonna see is tension in the acromioclavicular ligaments here, sorry, coracoclavicular ligaments here, right? The trapezoid and conoid. And because, because this lig these ligaments attach to the undersurface of the clavicle, it will create a posterior spin of the clavicle. So, and once again, a posterior spin is one of the movements that you will be observing when you perform upper extremity elevation. You can certainly feel that posterior spin so you know the reason why you can actually um, see it and feel it with your patients now. Let's take a look at the second movement allowed at the AC joint. So the second movement we will be viewing from the lateral view and you're looking at the glenoid here. So this is lateral to medial view for you. So um, the second movement here is anterior and posterior tilting of the scapula. So anterior tilting at the acromioclavicular joint, we have our clavicle that's stationary and scapula will be performing the movement. So here we have the anterior tipping and we can see how the inferior border of the scapula will be moving further away from the rib cage. And we have posterior tipping when the inferior border of the scapula will be moving towards the rib cage, and you can see these um, movements demonstrated on the image here as well. So anterior tilt, follow the superior angle. You can follow the superior angle or the inferior border. It doesn't matter. It's all about the your own landmarks. So follow the superior angle of the scapula as it moves anterior. So you follow the superior angle and it will be moving anterior. And for posterior tilt, follow the superior angle as it will be moving posterior. So an example of anterior tilt is a shoulder shrug. So when you shrug your shoulders, we know that the rib cage will go into more convexity and will round off. So in order for scapula to maintain congruency with the rib cage, 
it has to move into anterior tilt. It has to follow the rib cage alignment. For posterior tilt, you will notice posterior tilt at the acromioclavicular joint. And once again, it's this joint. Um, I wouldn't suggest thinking about scapula thoracic. I will be making another presentation on scapula thoracic, but do not think of it as purely scapular movement. It's the movement that occurs in between the clavicle and the scapula. So posterior tilt, you're gonna follow the interior angle as it comes anterior right in this direction. So posterior tipping we observe with upper extremity flexion or upper extremity abduction. In both of these cases, if you palpate a chromioclavicular joint, you will feel how the acromion actually tilts back. Alrighty, so let's move on to our last osteokinematic acromioclavicular joint movement, and that is going to be internal and external rotation. So internal rotation and external rotation, you can observe it from the lateral view once again. So here is the glenoid, here is, this is the right scapula. So internal rotation, you will see when the glenoid moves anterior, so towards the rib cage, and external rotation is when the glenoid moves outside, it moves away from the rib cage. So the purpose of all of these movements, not only um, IR and ER, and um, it's all of them, it's upward rotation, it's internal, external rotation, and it's the tipping, is really to fine tune the position of the scapula for the optimum placement on the ribcage. And like I said, secondarily serve as a good platform for humerus to allow glenohumeral movement. So internal rotation, once again, is when the glenoid fossa moves anterior and external rotation is when the glenoid fossa moves posterior lateral, okay? So these are your osteokinematic movements. Now, let's bring everything home, let's wrap it up. So th these are the two most important slides right now. This is what you're going to observe in your patients. Um, these are the complete shoulder uh, complex for full pain-free functional overhead movement. So when your patient presents, um, probably 50 to 60% of patients present with shoulder pain and they say, I am not able to lift my head, um, my arm here overhead. I'm not able to lift it into abduction. So this is the flexion abduction example. So what happens at the sternoclavicular joint? So we're going back to the sternoclavicular joint to summary um, everything up, to sum everything up. So first we observe three different movements at the sternoclavicular joint. The first movement that we will observe is clavicular elevation. So the clavicle elevates. Convex surface of the clavicle will roll superior and glide inferior, okay? So you observe superior roll, inferior glide elevation with upper extremity elevation. Secondary, clavicle will also retract. You will observe retraction of the scapula of the clavicle when you go into upper extremity elevation. So retraction, we remember it's a concave surface moving on a convex surface. So in this case, what you will palpate is a posterior spin and a posterior glide of the clavicle. Okay, so that's our second movement for upper extremity elevation. And lastly, we observe posterior rotation of the clavicle. And I mentioned that happens because of the inherent stiffness of the coracoclavicular ligaments that actually create that posterior spin of the clavicle. Um, that's an essential movement which permits full overhead reaching to occur. Okay, and finally, we have the acromioclavicular joint and here, these are your only osteokinematic movements because we cannot identify arthrokinematics movement. It's a planar synovial joint. Um, so there is, it's very hard to identify actual degrees of freedom and movements because it varies person to person. So here we have three movements, once again, with upper extremity elevation, whether it's flexion or abduction. We have first movement is upward rotation. Upward rotation is when the glenoid moves up, okay? Second movement is posterior tilting, okay? So you will be observing posterior tilting of the scapula. 
And lastly, we will observe external rotation. So it's when the glenoid moves laterally. It's move when the glenoid starts moving laterally and facing backwards. So for a chromioclavicular joint, three movements, upward rotation, posterior tilting, and external rotation. So these are the three movements that you will be palpating for when your patient says, ow, I'm not able to elevate my arm into full shoulder flexion. You will see, okay, do I really feel upward rotation of the acromioclavicular joint? Compare it to the contralateral side. Can I really feel the posterior tipping of the scapula or is it not tipping posterior? And can I really feel that external rotation of the scapula? So these are the movements that you will be looking for. Okay. And finally, we will do another pull. Three more pulls to go, actually. Um, let me pull this up. I think this is number six. Yes, this one. Okay, so I launched the poll, but I'm gonna read the questions first. So a patient presents with a chromioclavicular region shoulder pain after performing the following exercise. So it's the wand exercise when you go up into elevation. So once again, one of the most functional movements. Um, you observe the osteokinematic movements of the chromioclavicular and sternoclavicular joints and determine that the patient is lacking a posterior spin of the clavicle. What creates the posterior clavicular spin? Is it the articular surface at the sternoclavicular joint? Is it the articular surface of the chromioclavicular joint? Is it the ligamentous tension at the chromioclavicular joint? Or is it the sternocleidomastoid that pulls the clavicle posteriorly? I'm going to give you uh, 30 seconds for this one. And let's see how many of you will get it right. Good luck. Alrighty, so most people voted already. I'm going to end the poll. Okay, so the question is, what creates the posterior clavicular spin? As we discussed, the posterior clavicular spin is created by the ligamentous tension at the chromioclavicular joint. So 67% of you got it right. Good job. Very proud of you. Articular surface of the ST joint does not create the um, posterior spin. What it's responsible for, it's the glides, the superior glide, the inferior glide with elevation and depression, and the anterior and posterior glides with protraction and retraction. And the articular surface of the acromioclavicular joint is just the planar surface. So once, once again, um, the main movements that we discussed at the chromioclavicular joint osteokinematically is the upward rotation, it's the anterior tipping, posterior tipping, and external internal rotation. Okay, let me, let's do another one. And I just launched the poll. I'm going to show you the next question. Here we go. Okay, so same patient presents with a chromioclavicular region pain. After performing the wand exercises, you observe the osteokinematic movement at the chromioclavicular and sternoclavicular joints and determine that the patient is lacking a posterior spin of the clavicle with arm elevation. Now, what arthrokinematic movement should not occur at the SC joint? So he's moving into this. There is a lot of wording in the question itself, I know. But just read the, the end of the what arthrokinematic movement should not occur at the sternoclavicular joint. Think about the movements that I presented to you just two slides ago, the two main slides that I mentioned, and see if you can determine that. I'm going to give you 30 seconds. I'm going to mute, mute myself so you can read the question over again. 
All righty, and I'm going to end the poll. Let's take a look at these answers. So what orthokinematics movements movement should not occur at the SC joint? So most of you answered posterior spin, and that's because just now I, oh, how do I move this? Uh, most of, just, just now I was talking about the posterior spin is created by coracoclavicular ligaments. Okay, but posterior spin orthokinematically still belongs to the sternoclavicular joint, right? So it's the, you can still see the posterior spin belonging to the sternoclavicular joint together with, together with the superior, inferior glides, interior, posterior glides. So spin is also an orthokinematic movement that belongs to the joint, but it's not produced by the joint surface. That's why the reason why the previous question was not, the previous answer was not correct. Now let's take a look at this one. What orthokinematic movement should not occur at the SC joint? So as I mentioned just now, posterior spin will occur at the SC joint. Let's start with answer A, inferior glide. So as I mentioned, when you go into upper extremity elevation, we have a superior translation of a distal clavicle. So it's a superior role and superior role will be accompanied by the inferior glide. So inferior glide is present with upper extremity elevation. Now, superior glide is opposite of the inferior glide. So most likely that is the correct answer. Okay, so superior glide is the correct answer. It should not be present with upper extremity elevation. Now, posterior glide, do we have posterior glide with upper extremity elevation? Yes, we do. Why does this happen? Because I told you with upper extremity elevation, we have clavicular elevation and retraction. Retraction will be accompanied by a posterior glide. So it's a posterior glide and posterior spin of the proximal clavicular surface. Alrighty, and let's do our last one. I'm going to launch the poll, set it aside. And where's the slide? Okay. So same patient presents with a chromioclavicular region shoulder pain. After performing the following exercise, the wand exercise, you observe the osteokinematic movement at the chromioclavicular joint and sternoclavicular joint and determine that the patient is lacking a posterior spin of the clavicle with arm elevation. What osteokinematic movement should not occur at the chromioclavicular joint? What osteokinematic movement should not occur at the chromioclavicular joint? I'm going to give you another 30 seconds and mute, me, mute myself. All righty, let's take a look at the poll results. So what we have here, what osteokinematic moment should not occur at the chromioclavicular joint? We have three answers, posterior tipping, IR, and upward rotation. So let's think about posterior tipping. And I told you there are three movements that will occur at the chromioclavicular joint with upper extremity elevation. So posterior tipping is actually one of them because as you go into elevation, the scapula has to come down a little bit and tip uh, for the shoulder to, for the, uh, for the glenoid, for the scapula to be able to follow the rib cage. Now, uh, upward rotation. Upward rotation is 30 degrees and we said it, I'm gonna pull up, oops, um, the other slide here. Um, Upward rotation takes up about 30 degrees right here. So this is the upward rotation movement. And as we know, upward rotation is definitely one of the most necessary movements at the chromioclavicular joint. So finally, 46% of you got it right. So good job. Internal rotation is an, the incorrect answer. And it's incorrect because, oh, wrong window. Come on, I wanna move this. Okay, because we have external rotation occurring at the chromioclavicular joint.
Okay, so that's the movement that we will be observing with upper extremity elevation. Um, and of course, this is, I am not giving you the entire complete picture of the shoulder girdle mechanics because we're missing two more joints. We're missing the glenohumeral joint here um, and we're missing scapula thoracic, even though it's not a true joint, there's still movement that occurs there. So in order to be able to diagnose the entire shoulder girdle, you should be able to look at four joints altogether scapula thoracic, acromioclavicular, glenohumeral, and um, sorry, sternoclavicular and scapula thoracic joints. So once again, but knowing these kinematics, um, I feel like a lot of physical therapists, unfortunately, just directly jump to the glenohumeral joint just because we're so comfortable. And yes, a lot of range of motion does come from the glenohumeral joint. And a lot of studies been focusing on the glenohumeral joint, but that's not the only thing that's moving. As you can see that AC joint and SC joint have just as important uh, roles in upper extremity elevation. So I strongly suggest as a therapist, um, if you're a manual therapist or even in acute care, you know, these joints are so easy to palpate and so easy to look at. It takes two seconds, definitely worth looking at, and you'll be making significant changes for your patients in the first place. And I think that's why we're all here for it. Um, alrighty. And thank you all so much once again for coming. And here are my references. Our next webinar, the date is not actually set. Um, it will probably be in about three to four weeks. We will have you guys vote on it because uh, it might be on the weekend during the 4th of July. So if you guys want it, we can present during that weekend. Um, the next webinar, webinar will cover, once again, we're going to come back to the clinical gait analysis, but we'll be looking at the trunk and upper extremity movement. But I hope you enjoyed the shoulder webinar. Um, I had fun explaining it. And um, this is one of my favorite topics. So Thank you so much for coming. And if you have questions, you can either unmute yourself or uh, put it in the chat and I will gladly answer all of them right now. Thank you so much and have a great day.